Hi class, uh, today we will be turning our attention to the subject of ethics. And ethics is the study of right and wrong. Now, we just finished studying existentialism, and the existentialists held that there were no objective moral facts. This puts them in the camp of being ethical relativists, which refers to the theory that ethics is totally subjective in nature. In other words, ethics is relative to the individual. If you think lying is wrong, then it's wrong from within your worldview. If I think lying is right, then it's right from within my worldview. Importantly, for ethical relativists, there is no universal objective principles we could refer to to say that you are right and I am wrong about this, or vice versa. Sartre and others made a good case for this, but ethical relativism does lead us down some paths we may feel un uncomfortable heading in. For instance, an ethical relativist would not be able to say that bin Laden's act of masterminding 9-11 was inherently wrong. Rather, the ethical relativist would have to say it was right in reference to his projects and moral sense, but wrong when view viewed from many other perspectives. According to Sartre, we can condemn people, but that condemnation is rooted in the values and meaning we have created in the world. The condemnation is not based on a universal, objective, moral principle. Moral realists are philosophers who argue that there are universal moral principles, and we can use reason to figure out what they are and how to apply them. We're going to study those arguments today. As humans, we make moral judgments and evaluations all the time. Consider the account of Strawmeyer and Cash that I brought up in last week, uh, where Strawmeyer sexually assaulted a girl named Sharice and killed her, and Cash, knowing that the girl was in danger, did nothing. He waited outside of the bathroom where it, where it was happening, fully aware that the girl was being violated inside. Now we can look at this case in terms of singular moral judgments and basic moral principles. Singular moral judgments are moral judgments of a person or an action with a specific location in space and time. For instance, you are making a singular moral judgment when you say, Cash should have saved Charisse. Basic moral judgments are moral judgments of a kind of act or a mission. It asserts a generalization. For instance, it's wrong not to save an innocent life when you can. We are no longer talking about Cash and Strawmeyer, but we are rather referring to all people. So we often create moral arguments that combine claims about what is the case, singular moral judgments, and basic moral principles to justify our moral evaluations. For example, Charisse was an innocent child whose life was in danger. Cash could have likely saved her at no significant cost or risk to himself, but didn't. It's wrong not to save innocent children whose lives are in danger when we can at no significant cost or risk to ourselves. And then the conclusion, therefore, it was wrong of Cash not to save Charisse. Premises 1 and 2 are claims about what is the case. They are the facts, and they don't express a moral vocabulary. Premise 3 is a basic moral principle. The conclusion is a singular moral judgment that follows from the premises. Philosophers of ethics are primarily concerned with the why question. Why is it that, Cash, that what Cash did was wrong? And why is it that what Strawmeyer did was wrong? And in every why question, the answer entails some kind of moral principle. That is what philosophers of ethics are after. And this dates back to Plato. Uh, you think about the allegory of the cave. It's not enough that we see acts that appear good or bad. These are like the shadows cast on the wall. They are singular instances but point to a deeper truth, the universal form of goodness. If we can find it, we can know if and why the singular acts we encounter are right or wrong. 
we can look at the facts of the case, apply the basic moral principle, and conclude that someone's actions were right or wrong. A big branch of ethics is duty ethics. This branch of ethics asks us to consider what our duties are as moral people. For instance, is it our duty to increase happiness and decrease pain in the world? If so, welfare programs seem justified. We should decrease the wealth of people who live in excess and give it to people who don't have food or basic necessities. Is it our duty to follow the rules passed down from religious institutions, such as that we should not lie? If so, we should not lie, even if it increases happiness and decreases pain. So different duties come into conflict all the time. We feel a duty not to kill an innocent person, but at the same time, we might feel it justified to kill someone if it means saving 500. So which duties do we follow and why and when? This is one way of approaching ethics. Going from this direction, uh, it's helpful because we can look at different theories, criticize them, see which ones we like, and we can apply them to particular cases to see what the right or wrong thing to do would be. We can, for instance, apply these theories to abortion, euthanasia, gay rights, and other controversial issues and get guidance on what we ought to do. For Aristotle, ethics refers to how we can live life well. In the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, which is a book that he wrote, he writes, to speak about ethics is to speak about the customary behavior of a people, the standards of human excellence they hold themselves bound to, and the attitudes through which they express their character as a people. So this is not about duties. It's about developing a virtuous character. So examples of virtues. Honesty, hardworking, dedicated, compassionate. Those are virtues. Hillary Clinton and other politicians often refer to these attributes and others when talking about bringing, you know, strengthening the country. Why is that? Because from this way of looking at things, it's not just about what particular actions we should take, what duties we have but about developing a type of character that is strong and can think long-term and will develop the capacities to thrive, even in hard times. So for Aristotle, human beings aim at the good, and the universal human goal is happiness and well-being. Aristotle referred to eudaimonia in his writings as the good that virtuous people work towards. You is translated as good, and daimon is translated as spirit, so eudaimonia is often translated as happiness. According to Aristotle, then, when we are fulfilling our function as human beings, we are striving for happiness. The rational faculty that human beings have for attaining happiness is virtuous activity. In other words, we will be happy when we act in accordance with the highest form of virtue. But what is a virtue? According to a virtue ethicist, a virtue is a disposition that makes us good as a human being in that it makes us perform our functions well. So honesty is a virtue because we feel good about ourselves when we tell the truth and people in our community respect us more and trust us uh, good things come from that. For instance, it may result in a community member offering the honest person a job or a loan or something else that is helpful in living well. By being honest, we also perform our functions well. It helps us live with other people, have a clear conscience. It can help us lead lives where we'll have good credit, which enables us to buy a house or own a business, etc. Dishonesty is not virtuous because it often results in our feeling bad. It hurts our public life. It, it's hard to have healthy relationships with people, etc. So studying virtue ethics is different than studying duty ethics because it won't necessarily help us know what to do in a particular situation. What shall we do in the case of abortion? 
Well, duty ethics will refer to rules and might say something like, do what causes the most pleasure in the world and the least amount of pain. Or it might say a rule like, abortion is wrong in all circumstances, don't ever do it. These rules tell us exactly what to do. They tell us externally what to do. Virtue ethics gives us a command like this. It says, search within yourself and do that which helps you thrive. There are many stages in virtue ethics and much training in acting virtuously is required. Um, you need to learn from your mistakes and, and from your experience. Eventually, hopefully, you will get to a point where you are inwardly motivated to act well. A virtuous person will look at the particular situation and they will have a feeling or an inclination to do something, but won't be following a strict rule or a duty. So we've looked at virtue ethics briefly previously when thinking about Aristotle's argument for free will. Today we'll be focusing on two duty-based moral theories, utilitarianism and deontology. So utilitarianism. Utilitarians, starting with Jeremy Bentham, who first formalized the theory of utilitarianism, holds that the basic moral principle we ought to abide by is this, that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to promote the reverse of happiness. And by happiness, uh, we mean pleasure and the absence of pain. And by unhappiness, we mean pain and the privation of pleasure. So let's see how utilitarians would look at the case of Cash and Strawmeyer. Premise one, Charisse endured immense suffering uh, because she was sexually violated and murdered. The well-being of her friends and family also diminished greatly. Strawmeyer's well-being decreased because he will spend the rest of his life in jail. Cash will be shunned, will perhaps lose potential jobs or opportunities if people learn about his past. Cash's not saving Charisse allowed for one, premises one, two, and three to happen. And premise five, our moral principle, an action is wrong if it promotes the loss of well-being. So the conclusion is, it was wrong for Cash to not save Charisse. Now let's go back and compare this with our previous argument, which derived the same conclusion, but has an argument that looks very different. Okay, premise one, Charisse was an innocent child whose life was in danger. Premise two, Cash could most likely have saved her at no significant cost or risk to himself, but didn't. Premise three, it's wrong to save innocent children whose lives are in danger. It's wrong not to save innocent children whose lives are in danger when we can at no significant cost or risk to ourselves. And the conclusion, therefore, it was wrong of Cash not to save Charisse. So how can it be that the same conclusion is derived while the premises provided look so different? Well, the two arguments are applying different moral principles. And because of that, different facts about the case seem relevant. So what's the difference between the facts? The facts of the original argument refer to who people are and what they could have done. The facts of the second utilitarian argument, the one at the top here on the page, refer to the consequences of what's been done. How did people turn out? How did it affect their well-being? Now, it's not only what happened to Charisse, but what happened to all people affected after she was murdered. So utilitarianism is a theory of morality that is consequentialist, which means that an action is moral or, Im or immoral uh, based on its consequences. Morals for the utilitarian, then, are not concerned with mo motives. I'm sorry, I messed up the PowerPoint there. That should say not concerned with motives. <laughs> they are just concerned with consequences. To give you an example of someone acting well as a result of motive, uh, Jane can save a drowning man from a lake because she feels it is her duty. 
John might save the drowning man because he wants to get paid uh, a good reward for it. If motives were morally relevant, this might affect our moral evaluation of the act of saving the drowning person. Utilitarians think that motives are irrelevant from a moral perspective. In other words, both Jane and John act morally when they save the man from drowning in the lake because they significantly improve his happiness and the well-being of his family while only can, causing insignificant physical discomfort for themselves. So Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, uh, the two intellectual leaders of utilitarianism, continually refer to utility or the greatest happiness principle. When judging an act, we should judge it based on how it affects the happiness or suffering of people. Bentham and Mill were very concerned with making their moral theory fair, reasonable, and objective. So one person's well-being is not weighted differently than another's. This makes their approach very equitable. Further, Bentham came up with the hedonist calculus to try and make the utilitarian evaluation as objective as possible. So he thought happiness and suffering should be measured with regard to the intensity of the resulting feelings, the duration of the happiness or suffering, the certainty that things will unfold as we anticipate, the remoteness of the feelings, how soon the feelings will be experienced, fecundity is the likelihood that experience will produce even more pleasure in the future, purity is the chance it will produce pain or unhappiness, and the extent, how many people it will affect. According to Bentham, when I'm thinking about an act I plan on doing in the future, I should think about the amount of happiness or suffering it will most likely cause in all these categories compared to the happiness suffering or suffering it would cause if I didn't act at all. So let's look at a hypothetical example. This isn't true, but let's say that my mom is a big fan of Donald Trump. And whenever we talk about politics, we always end up arguing. Um, and if she calls me and asks me, well, what do you think about one of Trump's latest executive orders uh, that I personally disagree with, I can lie to her and tell her that I like it. Before doing this, I will think about the amount of happiness or unhappiness it will cause in everybody. So it will stop us from getting in a fight, which will increase my happiness. It will make my mom think that I'm aligned with Trump's policies, which will increase her happiness. What I tell her won't make any difference to the executive orders themselves, so nobody will be hurt by my lie. So should I lie to her? It seems to me that lying in this case is justified, according to utilitarianism. The happiness my mom would experience if I lied to her would likely not be very intense, uh, but judging from my previous experience, I think she would be intensely unhappy if she thought I disagreed with the direction Trump was taking our country. My own happiness would increase if I lied because I wouldn't have to get into a frustrating argument in which nobody's mind was ultimately changed anyways. The duration of happiness would last until the next political discussion for both of us, uh, when I'd have to decide whether or not to lie or tell her the truth at that point. I'm fairly certain that if I lie to her, uh, she won't ask any more questions and uh, will be happy with my answer. The happy feeling she would experience would be experienced very soon, if immediately. My relief would be also be felt quickly. Uh, the likelihood that the experience will produce even more pleasure in the future is high. If I continue to lie each time and she becomes more and more confident that I am in agreement with Trump, and with regard to purity, the chance the lie will produce pain or unhappiness is slim, although I suppose she could catch me in a lie, um, although this doesn't seem likely. Now compare this to another hypothetical unreal example. My girlfriend and I accidentally become pregnant, and we are going to have the baby. So let's say that my mom is a devout Catholic and strictly believes that people should not have sex before marriage. 
and it would cause her a lot of pain to know that her son and his girlfriend are pregnant. Suppose she notices that my girlfriend's body is changing. Uh, I can lie to her for as long as possible and tell her that my girlfriend is not pregnant. Uh, but should I? Well, I won't go through all of these categories, but I think you get the point. But a couple stand out. The happiness I would feel in my relief and that my mother would feel would be very short-lived, given that it will become clear that, that we are pregnant in a short amount of time. And the lie might cause rifts, distrust, and anger that wouldn't have been there if I told her right away what happened. And this would make the situation worse in terms of causing people suffering. Okay, You don't only have to explain that you had sex before marriage, but you also have to explain that you previously lied, you know. So in terms of the extent, uh, the child could possibly be affected negatively by the state of my relationship with the child's grandmother if I were to lie. So it might even affect my child further down the line. So in the first example, I ought to lie to my mother. And in the second example, I should not lie to her. As you can see, our concern here is not whether lying is right or wrong, but what consequences follow our acts and how much happiness or suffering uh, our actions will produce. In Bentham's hedonist calculus, it's clear he believed happiness refers to the quantity of pleasure. That is, we assign values in each category, tally up the results, and determine what we ought to do. If, for instance, you have the choice of spending your day getting a full body massage, followed by uh, time in a hot tub, followed by a sauna, followed by a fancy dinner, or you could study philosophy, which you also enjoy doing, let's say, you should add up your options, uh, the possible consequences, and take the one that offers you the most quantity of pleasurable experiences. So the first option gives you four points, and the second option gives you one point, because remember, we said that you enjoy studying philosophy. So you should therefore go with the first option. Get the massage, the hot tub, the sauna, and the dinner. John Stuart Mill was a utilitarian who followed Bentham and agreed that the greatest happiness principle holds that is, actions are right insofar as they tend to promote happiness and wrong insofar as they tend to promote, promote pain and suffering. However, he argued that not all pleasures are equal. Rather, happiness refers in part to the quality of pleasure. For instance, in his book Utilitarianism, he argues that pleasures of the intellect are greater than pleasures of sensation. That is, Intellectual pleasures have a, have a greater quality than do sensual pleasures, and so they should be given more weight. So in the example just given uh, of going to a hot tub or studying philosophy, both of which um, would make a person happy, we can give all the sensual pleasures, let's say, one point, but give intellectual pleasures five points. So then we'd still end up with four points for the massage, hot tub, sauna, and dinner, as these are all related to physical pleasures, and five points for studying philosophy, which gives the person intellectual pleasure. So according to Mill, if we accept those values for pleasure versus, you know, physical pleasure versus intellectual pleasure, then five outweighs four, and we should actually study philosophy. So for this reason, Mill says... It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. The pig presumably just experiences physical pleasures, and so its pleasure is of a low quality. However, oftentimes the most meaningful things humans do involve struggle, such as climbing a mountain to see a view or doing homework day in and day out uh, to get through school. You might feel physically dissatisfied in the moment, but you are pursuing a high-quality pleasure, and so your immediate dissatisfaction still trumps instant gratification because of the high-value reward set out ahead of you. 
So as a consequence of this, uh, Mill's political philosophy will require the development of people's intellectual lives. And in his philosophical writings, he brings a strong focus on schools and education. Okay, another important aspect of utilitarianism, its concern is the greatest happiness for the greatest number. In other words, you must calculate everyone's happiness to know if an act is moral or immoral. And this is true for Bentham as well. Everyone gets an equal vote. So Mill wrote, quote, The happiness which forms the utilitarian standard of what is right in conduct is not the agent's own happiness, but that of all concerned. As between his own happiness and that of others, utilitarianism requires him to be as strictly impartial as a disinterested and benevolent spectator. So utilitarianism might require a person to act against his or her own interests if it would increase happiness or reduce suffering overall for everyone. For instance, if you saw that a large truck lost control and was barreling down on a school bus full of kids, and you were in a position of pulling your car in front of it and taking the impact, saving many more lives in the bus, the utilitarian would hold that you ought to to look at the incident dispassionately, make the utilitarian cal calculation, and pull in front of the truck at your own expense. Because your well-being, after all, counts equally as the well-being of every single person involved, no more or no less. So critics of utilitarianism often argue that utilitarianism demands too much of people given that there are always ways we can sacrifice our own well-being to help a majority. For instance, I could throw myself into poverty and just donate time, all my time, to Habitat for Humanity, building multiple houses to, um, so more people could get out of poverty. I could donate my time in any number of ways, and, might, and it might come at, as a, at a personal expense, but would help many more. It's worth considering whether the moral theory is too demanding on people, given that we are always uh, missing opportunities where we could be making the world better. Another criticism is that utilitarians have a godless doctrine. And this is a quote from Mill. We not uncommonly hear the doctrine of utilitary, utility invade against a godless doctrine. He's addressing religious people here and their argument that utilitarianism doesn't adequately account for motives. For instance, consider the Beatitudes from Christianity, from the Bible. That not only should one not kill their neighbor, one should also not harbor any bad feelings towards them. So this rule refers to motives. It indicates that our motives matter, and it's not enough that we increase happiness and decrease suffering in the world but we should want to do so if we are to count our actions as moral. This is something worth considering. Can the ends justify the means? For instance, can the fact that someone, say, help feed 100 people justify the fact that she didn't really want to? On a related note, critics of utilitarianism note that the theory can promote acts that seem inherently wrong. Critics often refer to the, quote, tyranny of the masses. And this means that a majority places its own interests above a minority group. Suppose that a majority of people would benefit from the reintroduction of slavery. Slavery would, of course, cause significant harm to the oppressed. But if more people were to benefit from it, including benefiting in terms of high-valued intellectual pleasures, let's say, uh, for instance, uh, perhaps enslaving some people would allow hundreds more to freely pursue a world-class education. And then the utilitarian is put in a position of supporting slavery, which seems fundamentally wrong. On a similar note, using an actual example from history, people justify the nuclear attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which killed 340,000 citizens, by saying it forced the Japanese to surrender and ended an otherwise very long war, 
which might have killed many more than 340,000 people. What's being said here is that the targeted killing of civilians can be morally justified under certain circumstances. While many uh, critics of utilitarianism think that targeted killing of civilians in war or in peacetime is fundamentally and inherently wrong. This is related to the former criticism about motives. In both cases, critics agree. The ends don't always justify the means. Some things, including some motives, make an act abhorrent and immoral, even if it results in the greater good. So this brings us to deontology, the second duty-based moral theory we are studying this week. And deontology is a non-consequentialist moral theory that was made famous by Immanuel Kant, one of the most influential philosophers of the modern era. And the argument is that some actions are inherently wrong regardless of the consequences. So Kant's challenge was to come up with the necessary and sufficient conditions for what makes an act moral or immoral. He tried to create a moral philosophy that was not based on religion, but was rather based on reason, and was such that any rational being can review his theory apply his moral rule, and come up with the same conclusions about what is moral or immoral. In other words, he, like the utilitarians, was trying to come up with an objective measure of morality, just as science produces dispassionate, objective theories about the natural world. So his argument starts. Nothing in the world, indeed nothing even beyond the world, can possibly be conceived which could be called good without qualification except a good will. So what is a good will? Well, let's contrast it with virtue. Strength, agility, intelligence, and courage are all virtues. However, they are not good without qualification. Honesty can be used to allow murder. For instance, exposing hidden Jews to the Nazis would require honesty, but would allow murder. Strength can be used to rob a bank. So Kant argues that a good will is good without qualification. That is, if someone has a good will, they will, by definition, be good. We can see this by applying common sense. Common sense tells us that robbing banks is wrong. Someone with a good will just wouldn't rob banks. Doing so would give them an evil will. And why is this? Well, whenever someone acts, would they act according to desires. The bank robber desires the thrill of the robbery or the money they'll get if they can get away with it. Now, rational human beings can follow our desires or resist our desires. When we resist desires, we refer to our willpower. So, will is related to controlling our desires. And a good will is one that chooses appropriate, rational desires. So Kant believed that people have free wills. And thinking back to our discussion of indeterminism, Kant's picture of moral reasoning is as follows. We have beliefs and we have experience uh, and we experience desires. We then evaluate a situation by using reason where our willpower resides. And then we act to satisfy the appropriate desire. That is, if we are rational, we will let our reason decide between conflicting desires. No action will be undertaken until our will had been activated. So our will is master of our actions. According to Kant, if we are rational, our will won't be the slave of our desires, merely doing their bidding. Our will instead can cooperate with our reason and master our desires. Kant then argues that to judge a moral action, we must look at a person's reasoning, which is to look, in part, at their motives. So in the reasoning process, someone's intentions will indicate whether they have a good will or not. A person who has a good will will try to do what is right and avoid doing what is wrong. For Kant, doing what's right entails a feeling of duty to doing what's right. That is, the rational person desires to do that which is in accordance with moral law. 
So Kant disagreed with utilitarians that the moral law has to do with consequences. His theory is non-consequentialist, meaning that acting morally requires following moral law, regardless of the consequences. Kant thought that this was the moral law we ought to follow in all cases. It's called the categorical imperative. Act only according to that maxim by which you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. So how do we apply this moral law? Basically, you take someone's action and you desire a maxim out of it. Let's look at an example. I take out a loan for a home I can't afford. Okay? I figure I'll live in the house for a while and then I'll default. So now I must figure out what personal maxim or law I am following. It appears to be this. I will make a promise that I don't intend to keep to repay a home loan. Now we have to turn this into a universal maxim where it applies to everyone. So it would be everyone will make a promise that they don't intend to keep to repay a home loan. And then we test it. Can I, as a rational person, actually desire that everyone follows this rule? What would the world look like if everyone followed this rule? Well, we'd be in another financial crisis. Since people are breaking important promises, there would be less trust among people in the world, and banks would certainly not trust customers. Loan promises would essentially lose their meaning. So we would be willing that... Nobody needs to pay back their loans, but we would be in a world where a loan, as a promise to repay a lender, loses all of its meaning. And this means that there's a contradiction in the world we are trying to support from a rational standpoint with the world we would actually create. Okay, so this goes through it. Number one, I will make a promise that I don't intend to keep to repay a home loan. Then I make it a universal maxim. Everyone will make a promise they don't intend to keep to repay a home loan. Then we test it. Can I, as a rational person, actually desire that everyone follows this rule? Okay, and we learned that it's impossible. You would be rationally desiring a world that you would actually not want to live in. Okay, moving on. Kant's concept of the person is that a person is rational, is dependent in some ways. For instance, we depend on the earth and a human community for sustenance. And people desire happiness, which includes health, life, that our basic needs are met, and freedom, some degree of freedom. So Kant argued that when we will that everyone does something that could jeopardize any of these attributes for ourselves, we are falling into logical contradictions. For instance, consider the pre-Affordable Care Act days when insurance companies denied people on the basis of having pre-existing conditions. So let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield tells its employees to deny anyone medical insurance if they have a pre-existing condition. Now what would our personal maxim be? A company will deny anyone with pre-existing conditions medical insurance. Now, as a universal maxim, we would say all companies will deny anyone with pre-existing conditions medical insurance. Now, how does this universal maxim hold up to rational human desires? Well, Kant contends that rational beings are dependent. We depend on help from time to time. A rule saying all companies will deny people insurance if they have pre-existing conditions takes away that help. Therefore, one wishes to deny medical coverage to people who need it, while simultaneously wishing that, should they need it, medical coverage would be available to them. And this is a logical contradiction, like believing A and not A simultaneously. When a law becomes contradictory with rational human desires, it's deemed immoral. And this is why many agree that the re replacement of the Affordable Care Act must, as a matter of ethics and ethical principles, 
continue to protect people with pre-existing conditions. And sure enough, both Democrats and Republicans have hold this view. Now, the first formulation of the categorical imperative can be tricky. There are steps, including determining which moral rule is guiding you and, and how that would be changed into a universal moral rule. Kant provides a second formulation of the categorical imperative that is more intuitive in a lot of ways. And he says that we should act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means to an end. So what does it mean to treat someone as a means to an end? Well, we use tools as a means to an end. For instance, we use a hammer as a means to hammering. We use a television as a means to entertaining ourselves. We value these things for what they do to our lives. If the television breaks, we don't have a moral problem with discarding it, as it no longer you know, is good for what we want it for. A human can also be used as a means to an end, but Kant argues that this is always immoral. When a human is enslaved, that human is valued only for the work they get done for the slave owner. Rapists also use their victims merely as means to an end, uh, which can be their own sense of power. Okay. Treating someone as an end in themselves means respecting them as having inherent value. Now, students, including my, yourself, use me, a, a teacher, as a means to learning philosophy and getting a grade that satisfies a degree requirement. So this is not necessarily immoral because you also, hopefully, uh, I think that think that I have a right to life, a right to happiness, a right to freedom, just because I'm human. So this means that you don't use me merely as a means to an end. So we all use each other in different capacities all the time, but Kant argues that we should never use each other merely as a means to an end. So let's consider the case where, in the wake of Hurricane Matthew, someone donates a lot of money to Haiti so that they can receive fame and notoriety. Applying Kant's second version of the categorical imperative, it appears that the donator is using Hurricane Matthew victims merely as a means to an end, a means to acquiring fame. And this reveals something about the person's will and motives. For the utilitarian, the motive would be irrelevant, and the donation would be morally praiseworthy because it increased well-being in the world for so many Haitians. However, for Kant, it fails the categorical imperative, and so is not morally praiseworthy. It reveals that the donator wouldn't donate if there was little chance for personal reward, while a rational person recognizing that all humans are dependent on each other at different points in their lives, would see that treating them as ends in themselves would mean trying to provide them with resources because, because it's the right thing to do, and for no other reason. Now, just because utilitarians are focused on consequences and deontologists are focused on following justified moral rules, like the categorical imperative, regardless of the consequences, doesn't mean that they will always come to opposite conclusions about what people ought to do in different situations. For instance, if you could save someone who is drowning, both util utilitarians and deontologists would hold that you ought to save that person. However, they justify their conclusions in different ways. Utilitarians would justify the act by re referring to the pain that would result if the drowning victim died and their loved ones would suffer and um, if you were to ignore them. The consequences, therefore, are of primary importance. Deontologists would justify the act based on the logical contradictions that would result if we held as a rule that nobody should save drowning, a drowning person, even when they are capable of doing so. This would contradict, contradict our rational desire that someone help us if we were, you know, if I was drowning. Okay, this will conclude my lecture this week. 
As always, let me know if you have any questions about my talk or about any of the week's assignments.